Hi and welcome to the series of tutorials on Hibernate. Uh, in this series of tutorials, we're going to look at what Hibernate is, how we can use Hibernate in our applications, and we'll also understand the features that Hibernate provides. So what is Hibernate? Hibernate is something called as an ORM tool. If you don't know what ORM means, we'll have a look at that in just a minute. Hibernate is actually much more than an ORM tool. There are a lot of features that have uh, been added to Hibernate over the years. But uh, when it first started, it started as an ORM tool. Uh, so it's used in primarily in the data layer where you want to persist your uh, application data into a database. Thirdly, it implements JPA. JPA stands for Java Persistence API. This is uh, a set of standards that um, that have been prescribed for any uh, persistence up, you know, implementation that needs to be met in order to get certified as a Java Persistence API implementation. So what this means is that it, it follows the rules that have been set in the Java Persistence API specification so that later, if you, if you don't want to use Hibernate, you want to use some other provider which implements the same Java Persistence API, you can do that with minimal code changes. We'll have a look at what these are in uh, more detail in the subsequent tutorials. But first, let's try to understand what an ORM tool is and why it's required. So what is the problem that Hibernate is trying to solve? Let's take an example of a simple class that you have in your application. I have a user class example here. Uh, it has five fields, the ID, the name, address, phone number, and the date of birth of a user. Now, in a running application, you would have a lot of such objects in the memory. Say I have uh, five users in the application. Let's try to simplify it for the example. Uh, I have five users and uh, the data of a five users and my application is actively using that to function. Now, I would have five user objects in my memory. Now let's say I want to save these user data. Now how would I do that? I would use a database. And 99% uh, of the time we would be using a relational database because that is the most uh, common database, at least as of today. So I would have to persist all these uh, user objects into the database. Persist is again another word for save. So I would have to store all these user objects and the data in those user objects into the database. How would I do that? I would have a user table and uh, each of these user objects would have data for a particular user and I would save them as rows in the table. So what would happen is I would have this table like this. I would call this the user table and I would have five columns that correspond to the five member variables of this user class. So each of this data has to be saved. So let's say I have user object number one. I would save this as row number one in this table. User object number two would be saved as row number two. So depending on how many objects I need to save, I would have so many rows in this table. So a class corresponds to a table and an object of the class corresponds to a row in the table. So this is something that we have been doing over the years. And uh, what we normally do when it comes to a Java application is we would normally use a JDBC connection and we would connect to the database. And then we would take this uh, user object. Let's say I want to I wanna persist user object, uh, object one. Now I would take this user object and I would pull up all these um, fields and I would create a SQL query that would do an insert and I would insert it into this database. So depending on what the user's uh, information is, those data would go as a SQL query and it would do the insert. The same way, if I need to create the user object, I would have to do a select on this table. And uh, once I do a select, I would probably get a record set. Now I'll have to pass this record set and pull up all the individual data. And I will have to create a new user object and I'll have to feed in all the data. Say I've got user ID uh, one. Now in this new user ID, I would have to do a user.set ID and I have to give the value user.set name, I would have to give the name. So depending on what I've gotten in the record set, I would have to create the object. So the problem here is this. I have objects here in Java, but I do not have objects here in the database level. Uh, 
this is a individual entity that needs to be converted to this individual entity which is a row and the way we normally convert it is by using some boilerplate code which takes each of these properties takes each of the values of the member variables and maps it to SQL queries. Now this mapping is what is a pain. I need to convert each object into a SQL query and uh, for saving and then for retrieving I'll have to convert a record set into an object and I need to do this for each and every object. Say I have another class here there would be another table and I'll have to do the conversion every time. So this is a common problem to say it, to put it mildly, because, uh, you know, it, it, it's there in every Java application that has a persistence layer and it connects to the database in order to save and retrieve values. So what are the problems that we face here? What are the pain points? The first pain point, as I told you, we need to map the member variables to the columns. Each and every member variable that we have to persist has to be mapped manually. Of course, you can have a procedure for each of the objects and you know you write the code once, but you still have to do it. Now, let's say I add a new column or I add a new field in uh, my object. Now, I'll have to make those changes in the code in order to map it. I will have to go to that particular uh, loop, say, where I'm pulling up the record set data and I need to add this extra field so that from the record set I pull up this extra field. So any changes have to be done ourselves using, we need to write our own code in order to accommodate those changes. And you know, even otherwise, even if you're not doing any changes, you need to write the code in order to map this. The second pain point, mapping relationships. Now we saw, you know, a user object and a user table. Now let's say a user object has a reference to an address object. Now, how would it work? I, we would probably have uh, an address table. In that case, I would have to map the user object to the user table. I have to map the address object to the address table. And if there is a dependency between these two objects, I would have to create, uh, you know, a foreign key and then map it to a primary key. So, uh, you know, uh, the address table's primary key would be mapped as a foreign key of the user table. So this relationship also has to be taken care of. The third pain point, handling data types. Now, let's say I have, uh, I have a Boolean in my user object, say it's uh, active user. Now I want to track whether a particular user is active or inactive. So I can declare a Boolean and then I give a value of true or false. Now how do I do that in the database? Most of the databases do not have a Boolean data type. It would probably be a char so that I can save a Y or a N or it might even be uh, an integer where I would say a zero or a one or I could have uh, different data types which have a representation of a true or a false, but they're not really a Boolean. Now, I will have to handle this data type conversion myself when I'm actually writing the code to save the data or to retrieve the data. So this manual handling, again, is a problem because if you are uh, making changes, you have to go to that piece of code and then make the change in the code itself. Okay, fourth pain point, managing changes to the object state. Now I pull up the user information. I want um, user ID one, two, three. Okay, I pull it up from the database. I have a record set and then I create an object and I put all the data into that object. I have the object ready. Now I pass it on to the business service. Now the business service does some changes to this object. It updates, uh, I don't know, the email address or it updates the name, something, there's a change. Now, how would I manage this change? I will have to, again, manually execute the procedure. Uh, when I say manually execute the procedure, I mean that there has to be some other component which calls this procedure to make this change. It would have to trigger an update query. And what would be updated? Again, we will have to frame the SQL query ourselves. And depending on the value that has changed, we will have to update the database in order to accommodate the change. So again, this is something that we need to handle ourselves. So these are common pain points. We see this in um, in each and every application. There are a few others, but I'm just you know highlighting these because uh, these are something that we would definitely handle when we are writing uh, 
an application that interacts with the database. Now, what's happened is um, many times, because of all these problems, you would normally have uh, an object that maps to a table. So you say I have five uh, five tables. I would have five objects. And uh, most of the times, I've seen this happen a lot, uh, we would not worry so much about establishing object relationships. Uh, let's take the example of the user and address. Now, a user has a particular address. A user uh, row in the user table has a corresponding address row in the address table. And it has been mapped by a foreign key. Now, ideally, if I have to represent this as an object, I would have to have an address object and then I would have to associate it with the user object. But what I would do is, since it's a pain to establish this relationship depending on the, you know, the primary key and the foreign key, I would treat it as separate objects and I would establish the association based on the key itself even in the Java layer. This is actually a very bad solution and it's, I wouldn't say it's common, but I've seen this happen. Uh, it's tough to maintain these relationships and to maintain the whole object state because uh, what's happening in the relational side is completely different from what's happening in the object side. So there is this huge gap between a relational uh, way of doing things and the object-oriented way of doing things. So what usually happens is uh, since, uh, you know, we cannot change the relational part of it. We have to save this in the database. It has to go to tables. The data has to end up as a relational uh, set of data. So what usually happens is people tend to compromise on the object side of it. We would not have proper object-oriented uh, programming, and we would tend to compromise on the object-oriented design just because, you know, it's a pain to manage all of this and uh, what happens is our object-oriented design is influenced by the relational state of what happens to the data in the end. So this is a big problem. And this is something that many people have tried to address over the years. And uh, there have been solutions which handle this elegantly. And we see more and more solutions which provide more and more elegant uh, ways of handling this. And ideally, a solution that addresses this problem will help us map the objects with the relational database. Hence, the name of what the solution is trying to do is called Object Relational Mapping. So this is ORM. And this is the primary reason why Hibernate even came into existence in order to help the users to map such a thing. And uh, it, it's a framework which addresses this among other things. And uh, the primary use is to map this gap between objects and relational databases. In our next tutorial, we'll have a look at how we can write a simple Hibernate application, which you know uses uh, this Hibernate framework in order to save a user class into the database. See you in the next tutorial.